I can thank you all for coming this evening. I was driving in with some water for the reception afterwards in the back of the car, and I was coming up, trying to come up with a great pitch line to introduce uh, our artisan resident, Jim Hawkinson, this evening. And something stuck in my mind from junior high school, and that was a comment about the creation of art. It was, it's over 400 years old. And it says, and give to airy nothing, a local habitation and a name. That was Shakespeare who said that, and it's never been more true. It's not, not always been the artist's endeavor. Well, tonight we are very proud indeed to introduce to our community this year's, our 30th artist in residence, Mr. Tim Hawkinson. Before I introduce Mahara Sinclair formally, and Tim to be introduced by her, I just want to make an observation about the support that we have received over the years from any number of um, local community members, and certainly from the Pasadena Art Alliance. I had the great uh, joy of joining in a reception last week where we were given the largest single grant that we've ever received from that organization. And I said that afternoon to them, and I meant it sincerely, without that support, we would not be able to do this program at all. And, and I, so I want to give that in, in more, more broadly to the public by letting you hear that uh, voice by me directly this evening. I'm now going to introduce our gallery director, Mahara Sinclair. She is new to the position um, this year having uh, uh, competed against a group of uh, other applicants for that position. She's doing a wonderful job in that capacity, and I'm now going to allow her to introduce Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We're so glad that you could be with us for this really exciting 30th anniversary of our Artists in Residence program with the great Tim Hawkinson, so we're just thrilled that you could be part of it. Um, uh, so please join us after the talk uh, to go to the reception in the Boone Gallery, and um, he, we have some nice brochures that Michael Duncan wrote the wonderful essay for, so please get a copy of that um, as a memento too. And then we also have in our Gallery V, a three-person show with um, Lynn Aldrich, Miyoshi Baroche, and Doug Harvey's work. So please do catch that show as well. And it's, it's right in the next building over. So when, after you've been in the boon, it's just a little U-turn to the next building, and I can help you find it if you have any difficulty. Um, but it's a wonderful show, too. And it's a tandem uh, show designed to uh, companion um, Tim Hawkinson's a wonderful solo show. Uh, so uh, as, as our uh, special thanks to uh, Dean Joe Footner for his support in helping to get the show on the road, uh, or, you know, just off, and uh, for Charles Jones, uh, our gallery manager, who is just a huge, huge uh, part of how this whole thing works. Um, and so he, he installed the shows and both shows and also did all the graphic design and artwork for it. Uh, also the, the gallery staff and the volunteer docents for their uh, wonderful professionalism and support in bringing this uh, all together. Um, so as Joe mentioned, we could not do this without the Pasadena Art Alliance. We are so grateful to them. And also with our student services fund here on campus. Uh, the Office of the President and the PCC Foundation, and the Division of the Visual Arts and Media Studies Department. Uh, so I'm so grateful and happy to present to you our internationally acclaimed artist, uh, Tim Hawkinson, who is really one of the most incredible artistic geniuses of our time, and he has already been inspiring our students and working with them. He did a collaborative piece in the window at the Boone Gallery, so you can check that out. Uh, so, uh, and he's recently received a Guggenheim Fellowship for his extraordinary work. So, uh, it is a really a privilege, and I'm so happy to bring uh, Tim Hawkinson on the stage. Thank you, Mahara, and thank you, Joe. Thank you, um, PCC, for having me. And. From, um, oh, I was going to say, hello, Pasadena. I wanted to extend a greeting from, 
far and distant Altadena, which is <laughs> where my studio is and where I've lived for the past um, 18 years or so. Um, so uh, I guess I'll kind of jump into just the, the slides here and um, start talking about my work. Um, the, the first piece I wanted to show you was a um, early, early piece um, I made when we were, my wife, Patty Wickman, who's also an artist, um, we moved into a um, studio space in downtown LA in 85, and it was pretty much just a warehouse district, um, not much going on, but um, artists and um, some strange things in the alley. <laughs> but um, it, we kind of set up a domestic life in our, in our studio, and I discovered that I loved to cook, and um, so I was preparing this chicken dinner, and the recipe called for um, skinning the chicken, and I took that as a kind of challenge to remove the chicken skin as intact as I possibly could, just keeping everything cohesive. And um, I didn't really think I was making art at the time. I was just getting this chicken skin off, and then I wanted to make something with it. I, I um, built a wire armature and stretched the skin over it and realized this kind of football shape with twirly wings coming off of it. And um, I, I like it when my art just sort of takes over, where, when it um, becomes kind of a process and um, just this kind of uh, discovery that I wasn't really anticipating. Um, so th these early pieces um, were, let's see, I'm pressing the wrong button. Uh, whoops. The um, earlier pieces we're kind of addressing volume, kind of containment, and um, this kind of the skin. This is a, a piece called Dorito Polyhedron, where <laughs> I, um, <clears throat> I was interested in the kind of inherent geometry of that corn chip and just the, the triangle um, that would create this kind of polyhedron. So it's, it's about, well, you can kind of tell the size. It's about 16 inches in diameter. And um, I think it's still in existence. It, I, it was filled with foam just to kind of give it some stability. Uh, another um, kind of concern I had have still in my work is um, issues of sound. And um, I've always been uh, a lover of music and um, not, not a very good musician, but I took violin lessons as a kid. And Somehow, well, my, my mom never threw anything away. For, I, I think I kind of took after her. She kept my old violin. I think this was a three-quarter size from when I was taking lessons in maybe junior high school. Um, I took lessons for maybe half a year, but the, the violin stayed with us. And I took the violin and filled it with concrete and then <laughs> peeled, peeled the, the wooden skin away and... Um, found this kind of violin sound plug. Uh, the wooden piece that it retains is called the bass bar. I know that because um, since then I've gotten really into violins and possibly through my daughter's influence. My daughter Claire, who's 13 now, has had been taking violin lessons for seven years, I guess, and I kind of reintroduced myself to, to that kind of music through her. So it's been a great kind of rediscovery. But um, so this didn't make sound, but um, it, it does kind of indicate the presence of sound. Another piece um, early on, <clears throat> a piece called Organ. And um, this is all the wiring from an electronic organ. Um, I. I like to hunt thrift stores and swap meets, uh, PCC swap meet. I, I, a lot of this stuff actually may have come from your parking lot. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, in this case, it was a, a, an organ that I found in a thrift store. And um, this beautiful, like, I don't know, Wurlitzer or something. And the back was kind of pried off, and I could see this gleaming wire. And was really interested in um, doing this piece. I, sometimes. I, a lot of times, I'll, uh, an idea will just kind of germinate and change over time. Sometimes an idea will occur to me pretty much intact, and this was 
one of those instances. And um, so th the thrift store wanted $2,000 for this dilapidated organ. And I, you know, I just wasn't interested in spending that on art. So um, <laughs> came back a few weeks later and it was reduced to $500, which was still kind of up there. And then um, a few months later, well, it had disappeared, but then a few months later, I discovered it in their as-is yard, and I got it for $20. <laughs> so just uh, a lesson in patience, I guess. OK, now here's an early piece that does, did make sound. I think it still makes sound. Um, it's, um, let's see, it's my favorite. It plays, it's a music box, and it plays um, the song My Favorite Things from The Sound of Music. And um, I wanted to make a mechanical object just out of really scrounged, dirty, broken material that couldn't do anything. Um, stuff that I found in the alley behind our studio. And, um, but I, I wanted this kind of tension between that grunginess and this kind of delicate sound that it would produce. So. Um, it's a music box made of a, um, you see a, a roasting pan, which is kind of the resonating box, and a sparklet's water bottle, which would be the dust cover. And then the playing spindle is a, a piece of uh, a wooden dowel that has these screws and nails, and twist ties and things um, that I placed on it uh, one at a time and, and very carefully to get it to play the song. So it, they're the little pins that would be in a cylinder in a music box. And then the, um, <clears throat> the sound is produced by those pins um, sparking on a, a different note, which were uh, made out of steak knives, different cutlery that I um, whittled down or you know, ground down to the right note. And it um, had a, a really kind of funky um, way of playing. It, you know, it wasn't timed perfectly, it, 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 sound, it really had kind of the sound of somebody plunking it out for the first time, so making mistakes and hesitations. And that was um, something I was kind of hoping for. I wanted, I, I was interested in a, a piece that made us, produced sound that um, had a, a kind of human quality that you might hear in a gallery before you come around the corner and think it's actually somebody messing around with the artwork or something. Um, and this is an, another sound producing piece um, called Emoter, or no, I'm sorry, um, Ranting Mop Head. And um, yeah, that's much better. Um, it's a, a mop you see on the left side, and um, then there's a podium that contains a scroll with um, kind of dots and dashes notched out of it. And that controls uh, different valves and solenoids and, and uh, reeds that um, actually make the mop talk. All the, you can see the kind of mechanical devices arranged vertically along the, the spine of the mop. So those are, there's an initial reed which you know, produces the, the voice and then different ways of manipulating the um, kind of vocal cavity. So different ways of shaping consonants and vowels. And it was, it was hard to understand, but um, you could kind of make out some, some ranting. Um, I had, let's see, I had the mop, the, kind of the voice all figured out. And then I had just a, a bank of switches that controlled you know, um, the different sounds that it made. Um, part of my research was just, you know, I, I took a reed the reed was um, con connected to an air current so that the air would hit the reed and cause it to vibrate and give a sound. So I, I would put the reed in my mouth and without using my vocal cords, I was able to talk just using that reed. And um, so I, I was able to make some very simple things at first just by hitting these keys uh, to change the opening and closing. It said, um, I, it's hard to remember uh, everything it said. It said a lot of things. It had a kind of basic vocabulary, but with that I was able to come up with some inventive little phrases. Um, I want to mop your BMW or something. <laughs> uh, the first one was, are you my mommy? And it, it's obvious, I mean, it's so simple. I, I, I found that just by um, 
having the reed in my mouth just going, ma, ma, just closing that off with my hand. It's, you know, it's, it's the M sound. So that was kind of the first one, which was a no-brainer. But um, S sounds were kind of tricky. Um, and um, it requires a lot of tuning up. It's not shown very frequently. It's um, in somebody's collection, and I, I think they just kind of forget about it. <laughs> um, okay, so another a very a, a larger kind of so as, as, as I'm making these pieces, I'm uh, becoming also more interested in installation um, and just a, a larger presence that my my work can have in in the space and how to kind of address the space and. Um, Back uh, at the time, I was showing with Ace Gallery in Los Angeles, and it's this, I don't know if, if you, any of you are familiar with the gallery, but it's a huge space. Um, I think it's like 30,000 square feet if you add up um, all the gallery space he has. But um, I had a, a modest, I don't know, 10,000 square feet to fill up. <clears throat> and um, w one idea I had was this kind of tree form. Um, Actually, originally it was, um, it was going to be these figures suspended in scaffolding, but then I, I thought the tree was better. Uh, this piece is called Pentecost, and uh, Pentecost, um, the title refers to, um, well, it's on Pentecost, the Jewish holiday, the 12 apostles of Christ received um, tongues of, of flame and were able to speak in different languages. And um, I was interested in just doing this piece that kind of talked to itself. The, the different figures are all tapping on um, various parts of the tree with different body parts. Um, the foremost figure is uh, tapping with his kneecap. Um, the figure on the right um, holding the branch is tapping with his nose. And the one on the left is tapping with his toe. Um, the, the tree branches, the parts that the figures are tapping on are actually these kind of percussive objects that I embedded in the tree, tin cans and buckets and things that would have more resonance than just the cardboard that the tree is made out of. So, um, so it had this real kind of percussive um, rhythmic pattern that it produced. Another sound piece. Um, don't look at the chair, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Just the bagpipe, um, that's a bagpipe. So it's a, a self-playing bagpipe and it has the proper chanter, which is kind of in the foreground in front of the bag on the kind of tripod. And then there's uh, three drones that are hanging in the air. And, um, oh, and then there's a, another kind of playing scroll, a playing kind of, brain component on the far right. So that, again, had these, uh, these different patterns encoded into it so that it could play. Um, well, it played, oh shoot, we missed, uh, we're, we're a couple of days late. It played the Irish Spring Soap commercial, which would have been <laughs> perfect for St. Patrick's Day. Um, it played Amazing Grace. Um, it, anything that sounded, that I thought sounded good with drones. So a kind of basic melody with a lot of drones. So having done that, um, I, I think um, a museum in Massachusetts, Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art has a huge space. You know, you could fit like three or four ace galleries in this place. And th um, they contacted me and, and wondered if I had any large scale ambitions for their building five. Uh, which sounded kind of scary. Building five is pretty much the size of a football field. It's 55 feet wide and um, 300 feet long, I think. And um, so I had done the, the bagpipe piece and um, I was kind of interested in doing, just maybe enlarging that. And the result was a piece called Uber Organ, which here is um, installed at Ace Gallery. Um, it consisted of 12 kind of bus size bags with horns connected to them and then um, a kind of controlling brain device, again, uh, 
with these, a scroll of, of dots and dashes that controlled different switches which operated the different horns. So there were 12 horns, 12 bags and 12 horns, which gave me a, a complete octave of notes, but um, nothing to go above or below the octave. So, um, so it played songs, kind of the songs that could be recognizable. They're in kind of the popular realm, but um, because they were all kind of contained within an octave, it kind of distorted them a little bit. And also, it was they're real low and droney, so it might have been hard to pursue music in that as well. But um, here it is at, at Mass Mocha, so you can kind of get a, a size of the scale. Uh, it was an old textile mill and built, I think, in the 19th century, this brick building. The ceiling was nice that had these uh, ribs in it that really kind of worked as, um, gave it the feeling of, of the, these kind of organs in a body almost. And um, here is Uber Organ at the Getty and it, at the, in the um, foyer of the Getty. And it, it, that, I think, sounded the best because it was this really um, hard space, very reflective um, of sound with lots of glass and travertine, hard and expensive, I guess. But um, it, was, it, it sounded amazing there. So um, there, in this shot, you can kind of see, maybe um, understand how the, the scroll um, goes through the, uh, these pulleys, these rollers, and um, and then it's read in, it, it's um, kind of deciphered in, in this cage-like structure, the red structure down at the bottom. Um, yeah, so that's Uber organ. If, when, I, when I showed it at the Getty, I had to um, kind of uh, condense it a little bit. I had the same 12 horns, but I had to run some of the horns off of the um, same bag, so there were like six or seven bags. Okay, so that, that's um, kind of addressing the, the sound component in my work. I've, I'm also interested in time and just um, kind of the perception of time and watching, kind of watching time maybe. Um, this piece is called Slug, and I, I wish I had a shot of the, the backside, but um, it has a motor at the base, and the motor's rotating at something like um, oh, maybe 20 RPMs, 20 revolutions per minute. Very perceivable motion. You can see the, the spinning disc. And, and then that motor is connected to a gear, the, the little circle at, at the lowest part that you can see. So that gear is going a little bit slower, and then the gear next to it is going slower. And they just keep gearing down slower and slower and slower until the, um, there's a little needle sticking out at the top, a little, um, like a clock hand. And that um, rotates every, once every 20,000 years. So, <laughs> so hence the title Slug. It's, um, this is my, kind of my homage to um, CNH Surplus, which is, it used to be just down, down the street from PCC. Yes, I'm a local boy and I shop locally. But unfortunately, they're, well, they're actually, they're in Duarte now. If you need gears, that's a place to go. Um, so this is kind of, this piece, uh, just now we're just talking about the, the circular piece on the stand. Um, this piece is called Spin Sync, and it's kind of the same idea, but just um, sort of emphasized on um, extremes. There, uh, there on the, the left-hand side is a little tiny, toy, um, like a slot car motor that's spinning, whining away at like 30,000 RPM. So you can't see the spin at all. You, you just see, you don't even see a blur. You just hear a annoying kind of sound. And then, um, then as it slows down, you can see the, the gears spinning, um, going slower and slower. And um, I found that um, as the gears go slower, I didn't really need to keep them, you know, this expensive alloy aluminum gear tooth. So I, I pretty quickly switched down to cor wide whale corduroy, which still had kind of the interlocking teeth, but um, didn't have the durability, but it was easier to use and make my own gears with. So, um, so it's going slower and slower until 
you, you can see um, what it, each disc has a, an arrow. And when I initiated the piece, all the arrows were pointing towards the um, initial motor. So you can see there hasn't been any shift in the, the last like, eight or nine gears. And then after the red gear, you can see some disruption in those triangles. They started, started moving around. So the last gear, t um, it, according to my math, um, makes one rotation every 100 years. So nothing like slug, but it's, it had a lot of punch just in scale. Um, I don't have, a, I don't think I have very many images of the way I was installing my work at the, this time, but um, this, this gives a kind of indication. I just wanted to point out how um, I was interested in um, every, just allowing everything to show and um, having um, kind of the, the wires that are going to power pieces, um, the, those were all suspended in the gallery. And um, occasionally the, the wire will take a little break and, and do a doodle kind of. So here it's um, a woven extension cord, which is um, a, a piece called Gordian Knot, the, the blue kind of doily shape. Okay. Um, okay, another... Um, kind of mechanical piece uh, called Signature. It's related somewhat to the mop head. Um, with the mop head and with Signature, I, I kind of was interested in this sort of awe effect, just using these humble materials to, to this sort of, I don't know, well, it's sort of an amazing end, just that, I mean, you can watch, um, it, it, well, okay, I should explain the piece. It's a, um, it's an automaton that signs my name and then chops the signature off and just drops it into the pile. There's my name. It, it, it writes my name kind of the way I wrote it as I did when I first learned cursive, like in third grade. It's very careful and dots the I, but everything's kind of scrawly. So, um, so there's a disc that's rotating where the student would be sitting, and that has my name kind of encoded into these, this wire track. And then um, there are little arms that come off of, the, well, that control the pen that read that wire track. Um, so it's, you're sitting, you can watch it slowly write my name. And, and it's, um, I guess, kind of mesmerizing. You don't see a floating pencil writing Tim Hawkinson every day. And, um, and then all of a sudden, there's this alarming chop. And then you know, so it chops the signature, and it drops it. So in retrospect, it kind of became about, um, I guess, establishing your identity, sometimes to the point where you're pushing people away. Isn't that poetic? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, and another, so that was kind of a signature piece, or a self-portrait piece. Um, and this is another um, kind of self-portrait. I don't really like calling them self-portraits, but I use my body. Um, I my body and took the hair off of it and covered it with latex, rubber, balloon, kind of balloon latex, and peeled that off and turned it inside out and inflated it. And I, I, think, um, I think I got the idea when I was in, I don't know, fifth grade, sort of, um, just when we, we would be gluing stuff and peeling the glue off of our skin. And I always thought that was fascinating. So. Um, that was kind of the initial, I guess, kernel of the idea. But um, I was really interested in just what a, it, it's, it's a negative mold of myself, but it's generally positive. You know, it's, I took it and turned it inside out, so it's really a negative. So if you look at the ears, they're all screwed up, and the eyes and the, the nostrils, are, it's actually the interior of the nostrils that are coming out. So if you looked at it closely, all the, like the fingerprints and everything would be backwards. Um, so I was primarily interested in just what the, the inflation did to, to the body, to, or you know, to that volume. And um, I haven't lost any weight. I was skinnier than I am now. But, um, so it, it just inflates. It, it takes you know, the largest volume, and that's where the stretch really occurs. So my torso really kind of stretched out. So in this installation, um, it had a um, positive flow of air coming to it through its heel. You can see the tube kind of linking down to his foot. 
And the air came from a, um, a piece in the room behind him, which was called Reservoir, where I um, took the same latex and painted it on the wall of the gallery and, then, um, and anchored it around the perimeter and then inflated that so it was this big bulgy balloon coming off the wall. And lots of fun to like run up to and push yourself into. It was very bouncy. But, um, so, so that was kind of the, the air for the um, balloon self-portrait. I'm going to pull out my clock to see how we're doing. Okay. Um, this is a piece called Blind Spot, another self-portrait. Um, in which I was interested in, um, well, like in the chicken skin, I was, I, I'm interested in these processes that um, kind of take you, take, take the piece um, somewhere unexpected. So um, blind spot, I, I wanted to kind of document my, the parts of my body that I couldn't see directly just by bending my neck. So I took a ballpoint pen and looked down at my chest and traced kind of the periphery of my vision, just, um, just at the edge of where I could see, and trace it around my shoulders and my back and my butt. And, um, and then I had Patty um, photograph everything within that boundary. And um, so, so my chest is up at the top, and then the two points at either side are, are my, my um, shoulders, and you can figure out the rest. But um, so I, I, I took these photographs and, um, and pieced them together into this kind of map that turned into a kind of fish-like form, which I was a little surprised at. And then uh, conversely, uh, is a piece called Humongous, which is depicting all the parts of my body that I could see directly without a mirror. And um, it's a painting. And so I, I guess I started with my left hand and gridded a portion of it off just with squares and um, painted just the information in each square <coughs> and just kept growing that the drawing just growing this kind of grid of ink squares that I had on me for um, I guess it you know took a few weeks to, to work my way through everything um, Oops. So um, there's obviously quite a bit of distortion. There doesn't really need to be. I kind of let it happen. Um, I, areas that I was able to see easier, just like, so I'm right-handed, and so I was able to spend a lot more time on my left hand, just kind of glanced over my, my right hand. And um, then I think I just made the foot bigger to fill up the bottom of the page. <laughs> But you can do that, you know, with, when you're working with a grid, it's great. You just expand the grid and the image just, it's, it's like pre-Photoshop. I mean, I guess there was Photoshop then, but I don't use computers at all. I mean, I, I do actually, I, I do use computers and I do use Photoshop. Everything I'm saying is a lie. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't use, um, I don't use, if I use Photoshop, it's, then I kind of turn it in, turn it backwards well, I'll show you one later, but for the most part, I'd, I'd like to try and figure out processes that you could easily do on a computer, but just figure out for myself in the studio with whatever limited means I have. Um, okay, here's a, a, a piece called um, height, determined, height Determined by Weight. And I took, the idea is that I took a, a full cast, full body cast of myself and put it on a scale and poured it, poured molten lead into it until it reached my weight. Actually, I, I knew it wouldn't go very far up, so I just cast my legs my, below my knee. And, um, but I, did, I, I took this cast of my feet and took it to a, a lead foundry and um, had them, we put it on a scale and poured in um, that undisclosed number. <laughs> Um, so here is another kind of, well, body piece. This, this is called um, the fin within, and again, it's taking a cast of my legs. It's actually a cast of the space between my legs. If you see in the fin, you can kind of see toes and uh, footprints kind of embedded in the, the base of the fin. And then um, 
if you looked at it from the side, you would see these kind of the negative leg shapes. So I took this cast of the space between my legs and carved it as a fish tail. So kind of realizing my inner fish. Um, so, um, well, this piece is called Feather. And um, I wanted to talk about how ideas can occur just a lot of times ideas come to me when I least expect it, just being stuck in traffic, my mind is wandering. Or a lot of times it's um, misreading some kind of visual information that I see. Uh, in, in this case, um, Patty had just given a, a little trim to our dog, our shaggy terrier. And so I had just seen a little tuft of fur on the studio floor, and I thought it was a feather. What's a feather doing in the studio. And you know, I picked it up and re realized, of course, that it was this hair. And I started thinking about how, well, like my hair is kind of like a feather. It's, um, I could make a feather out of my hair. So, so I made a feather out of my hair. And, um, I took out all the, um, the white hairs that I could find and um, super glued them together to create the sort of central spine. <clears throat> and then plucked out individual hairs and super glued them onto that spine. And um, at first I, w I, I was like cutting them and super gluing them on. And then I did you know, like a laboratory test. I tried pulling on it and it came out pretty easily. And then I, I tried plucking the hairs out by the root, which um, I think that raw root really bonds well to the super glue. So <laughs> in the laboratory tests, the hair actually broke before the bond released. So, um, okay, so that's Feather. And then um, another little creature from my kind of gross natural, natural product, um, a little bird skeleton made out of fingernails and um, toenail clippings. Um, so it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> I just, I will say I had to grow out my pinky fingernail extra long to shape the, um, the skull to get enough volume for that. And I, um, most, of the, um, most of the little pairing, nail pairings are used pretty much as they came off the clipper, but sometimes I had to uh, manipulate them a little bit with heat and steam. So again, um, super glue. And then um, this, little egg is, it's about, it's small, it's about the size of a robin's egg. And um, it's composed of ground up, um, ground up hair and fingernail clippings. So, um, okay, so do you remember in Pentecost, the, the guys that were pounding on the tree branches, um, this is actually the, the little homunculi that, that started all of that. Um, I, I, I wanted to, um, I guess, do kind of a, a full body 3D scan in my bathroom, just, you know, in the confines of my own home. I, um, I mixed up some ink and um, poured it into the bathtub and then climbed in the bathtub. I guess I, I did it in two halves. I did my upper half and my lower half. So, First I did my upper half and I laid down in the tub, you know, all the way, I immersed myself in this ink. I guess I read through a straw or something. And Patty photographed as, um, as we let the, the ink, wait a second, no, actually, the first, the first one was when we were filling the tub up, of course, yeah. So, um, and that was the lower half, which is cleaner, um, you can see. So the tub is filling up with ink and um, Patty was photographing every, couple of minutes as, as, well, every 15 seconds probably as, as the um, level rose. And then, um, then I shimmied down and, and immersed myself and we let the, the ink out and um, photographed as the water, as, as that drained out. So it gave these um, kind of steps, the um, topographical kind of outline of my body at different depths. And I cut the images, the, the, those parts that weren't covered with ink, I cut them out and laminated them together to create the figure. Um, and so then um, 
I had some other ideas besides Pentecost for, for that pattern. Um, I was interested in doing a, a life-size drawing of um, kind of, well, of, of myself of using that pattern. It's, the piece is called um, Bath Generated Lace Self-Portrait. <laughs> so in, in this uh, drawing, I invented uh, different lace patterns for each step of the ink bathtub. And um, I, I would practice this kind of calligraphic um, drawing, I mean, that, that pattern, and just get it kind of in my finger memory, and then just go through and fill in the, the, the rings. Um, okay, so, yeah, yeah, I don't use Photoshop. <laughs> um, so I, I did, I, um, but do I have a detail? Okay, yeah. Um, so, I was um, amazed at, you know, what you could do with a digital camera and, uh, and a monitor. Um, so, I, I was photographing my hands and I wanted to do this piece using my hands in just different random gestures. And um, the hand, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, it's a little trite, but the hands are so expressive. And so, um, they get smaller and smaller, and um, there, no two hands are the same. There are all these different kind of hand expressions. Um, so I, I sized, a, 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 I kind of figured the whole thing out on my computer, and then um, and printed like the largest one in, in these different tiles that I fit together, and, and um, printed the, the hands, um, the, the, the second step down um, individually in these, like 13 by 19 sheets. Um, it was all, they were all printed um, individually and then um, razor laminated together, razor cut and spliced together, uh, which, I don't know, seemed important to me. Um, this is another um, hand collage uh, called Fruit, and it is depic depicting the fruits of the spirit. Here you can see it. Uh, you know, spelled out in finger and hand letters, love, joy, and peace on that hand. Um, another photo piece, um, octopus, using the body of the octopus. I was looking at this earlier today, and I had a hard time remembering, but it's, the body is like the palm of my hand with these stubby fingers coming out, and then arms and legs that are kind of um, pieced together. But the the main attraction is the suckers, which are all um, photographs of my mouth. Photos and scans. So I, some, somewhere it like scans where I put my lips right up against the scanning bed, which was, um, I guess it's good we don't have any details. <laughs> um, okay, this, uh, another, back to the kind of mechanical work, um, a piece called Emoter. And um, I was interested in just taking kind of random, um, a random signal, random information, and making kind of sense out of it. Uh, the random signal comes from a little television monitor um, at the base of the stepladder, the little black box. And um, that monitor has little um, light-sensitive uh, switches, or, um, you know, it's the, the little device in, um, in the night light, when you turn the light off, it turns the night light on. So these uh, little switches read, if, if there was an illuminated portion of the screen where they were stuck on, they would switch on. If the screen was dark in that portion of the, uh, in that portion, they would switch off. So um, I just put the TV on a, a random station and um, had these switches connected to different um, features of, of my face. So there was a, um, a switch that raised or lowered my eyebrow, or opened or closed my eye, and, and so forth. So uh, I'm going to go through kind of quickly. I don't want to scare you, though. Okay. Oops. Let's see? See that motion? Whoop. Wow. Look at that. Sorry. Now I'm lost. I don't know where I am. Wait. OK. So um, it was sort of mesmerizing. It's, and uh, the embarrassing thing is, if you look at the bottom, um, I have a little a silly little goatee. No offense. <laughs> um, 
So the, the face, sorry, the face is about three by four feet. And it's, you know, it's, you, you can stand, well, the, the cool thing, I, I guess, is that um, it never repeats a, a facial expression. And um, so, so the way that you are reading, kind of making sense out of this nonsensical um, input is just that any, we're so used to, you know, reading people's faces, so anything that it does, you, it emotes kind of a response, and you kind of are forced to make sense of it. Okay, goodbye. So um, uh, here is Tim as a motorcycle. Um, I, I guess another, okay, so we talked about sound and mechanical stuff, and another kind of interest I have is in, um, well, um, modes of, of uh, motion or ships and, and, and boats and uh, motorcycles, I don't know. Um, I guess they're, they're machines that have all of their guts kind of on the outside. So you get a sense of that in, in looking at my work that I, I like everything to be kind of visible, all the um, mechanical components. And so the, the motorcycle is, all, is, is a instance of that. So I think I, I made the motorcycle mainly so I could make the front tire, which is just, you know, my interlocking fingers to create the tread. Um, a feather motorcycle. So um, you look at an ostrich feather and it looks exactly like a gas tank on a motorcycle, right? <laughs> so that's where that came from. Um, so it had, um, you know, everything was feathers. I, figured out how to make interlocking chain um, feathers for the, for the drive chain. All different kinds of feathers. So this one I didn't get from the PCC um, swap meet. I had to go downtown to the Feather Mart. Uh, okay, um, Das Tannenboot. Um, it's, a, it's a Christmas tree and it's a boat. So I took a Christmas tree and um, re-rigged all the, the branches as, as sails to create this mad sailing galleon kind of ship. And if you look at my show, you can see I haven't come very far. I'm still playing around with Christmas trees. Um, okay, what is this called? Um, oh, Mobius ship. And it's a, a ship making a, a Mobius turn kind of in mid, mid um, hull. And um, so I, I didn't really, you know, know what it was going to look like. I, I just started building this hull in my studio and adding the, the sails. And, um, it's, I like finding these um, pieces that have this really kind of engaging process that you can kind of get lost in. The, the lace drawing piece was one instance where, um, you know, it, it becomes kind of meditative doing all this rigging and um, sail making. Um, okay, we're almost done. This is a, um, a large piece. This is a small model of a large piece. Um, I've started doing a few outdoor pieces. This is a piece that I did for UC San Diego. They have this amazing outdoor sculpture collection called the, the Stewart Collection, you may be familiar with. And um, the woman who runs it, uh, Mary Beebe, asked me if I had any ideas for them, and I had um, just driving through the desert, just you know, seeing these beautiful boulders out in the desert, granite boulders, um, kind of they looked like stuffed animals to me. They looked so soft. Well, this this is a really blurry picture, but they they do look soft um, and stuffed kind of. So I wanted to make a a, a teddy bear out of boulders, and. Um, and she liked the idea, and they, f they found other people that liked the idea, so we proceeded with, with the idea. The, the challenge was um, finding these large boulders that, that looked like, whoops, that looked like that. Because, you know, when they get really big, they get really kind of beaten up. And um, so you'd, you'd find this perfect, like, torso boulder. But really, the challenge was finding the right torso boulder. Once we found the right boulder for the torso, that kind of dictated the size of, of the legs and head and everything else. So we were looking for the biggest 
kind of nice boulder that, for the torso. And we finally found this one, um, and it had to be near the near in, in kind of the San Diego area because the only cost involved in this, besides engineering, actually putting it together, was um, transporting the boulders. We found the boulders on a, a foundry, I, I think, or a, a quarry. Um, I, I think they actually forgot to charge us for the, the big one. <laughs> they were just glad to get rid of it because it was sort of in the way. And you could see where the, like the backhoe had kind of marred it in places, which I kind of liked. So um, they're putting it together there. Um, you can see I'm the guy taking the picture. <laughs> um, and here comes the head. So um, I'm going to go back. Um, and explain. So once we'd found all the, uh, the boulders uh, in sight, we, we uh, contracted somebody to come in and scan the, the boulders. And um, then we printed up a um, workable size model of, of each rock. So that enabled me to put the whole thing together just in my studio. And um, that was kind of the extent of my involvement, other than, that, than you know, just cheering on the uh, construction workers when they were putting it together. Um, oops, sorry. So it's all um, pinned together. It, um, the, the boulders were cored, and then um, you can see at the top the neck pin. It's, um, they're massive, like 12-inch diameter steel pins that are epoxied. They don't use super glue. They use epoxy. <laughs> And then the head. And then there's the family. Uh, everybody's sick in my house right now. so And you can hear my voice probably, but they wish they could be here. They say hi. Um, and so um, there it is in San Diego. And then um, the last piece is another kind of bear, and some kind of animal, kind of family sculpture. And this is, um, it's pretty big. I mean, it's nothing like the. So the, the bear is, well, you can see it's like 30 feet high. Um, this was maybe 10 or 12 feet high. It's the, the mama bear with the daughter in her mouth, and then each, it's all these generations. And it goes down 12 generations to this little teeny tiny baby. <laughs> and um, so we have six minutes for questions. <laughs> it's made out of... Um, well, okay, it's, I started with, a, I made a basket out of real lightweight bamboo and then took um, spray foam, urethane foam, and we put the foam on a sheet of paper and stick it on the basket and to develop, it's not funny, this is serious art making, um, to develop that kind of volume. And then um, cardboard over that with um, poly, with, um, um, fiberglass resin, just, not fiberglass, but just the, the, the resin that you use with fiberglass. So it's all the toxicness without any of the stability. <laughs> but that gives it the kind of drippy honey look, like it's been dipped in honey. So, um, more questions? Yeah. Responsible for the music playing in the courtyard? At the opening? Or, the courtyard just tonight? No, I haven't been out in the courtyard. What are they playing? <laughs> no, no, I had nothing to do with that. Oh, oh, really? Uh, Mahara, maybe? Um, actually, could we have the house lights on, maybe, uh, so I can see people? Um, did you have a question? Yeah, I was going to ask. Do you think that through all this work that you've done, you have any uh, thematic concerns that have been spanned in all of your work, like looking back? Um, well, investigations in the body um, uh, continue. I'm, oh, she's wondering if there's any um, kind of theme that um, has continued pretty much throughout my work. And I would say, you know, the, the work I do with my body has been, it's changed a lot. I mean, um, right now I'm, I'm working on um, just these little kind of bulby body parts that I'm sticking together into almost like pine cone forms. So, um, slowly, the body is becoming really abstracted, I guess. Um, yes, in the back there. Um, how long did it take you to do that, um, that giant sculpture like in the college backyard? Um, the, the bear? Yeah, the bear. 
Um, the bear uh, didn't take, a, well, it, prob probably three or four years, which is pretty fast in geological time. But, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but for, for, a, for a, a large um, outdoor piece like that, it's pretty fast. And they have um, an amazing team there that's equipped for kind of um, pushing these projects along. Yes. How are you different now than you were when you were 10 years old? Um, well, I, I, I do want to stay kind of curious and um, kind of convey that sort of um, exploration. I'm, I'm tired, more tired, and um, <laughs> more, I, I'm just so easily distracted now just by stuff, you know, it's, it's harder to stay focused, I think. When I was 10, I could work on something, it seemed like for days, but you know, your perception of yourself as, as a 10 year old is completely distorted anyway, right? Yes, sir. Your installation pieces uh, have a nice bit of mechanical flavor to them. How did you come upon that? How did you acquire that skill? Um, well, tried to kind of convey that in, in the presentation, just um, like starting with this pretty basic piece, the, the music box, which um, it was just, you know, a simple rotating cylinder hitting these little pins. Um, I, I started with, with really basic stuff like that and um, slowly um, kind of let it evolve uh, into more complex kind of, uh, systems, it's all still very simple. I mean, it might look complicated, but it's, there's no, um, I, in the mechanical pieces, I, I kind of hinted at this. I, um, for me, it's, it's important to be able to look at it and be able to kind of figure out what's going on. Um, just, I guess maybe that's part of, well, I don't know, like, it's not magic, but just, you know, the, the attraction for me is just that, um, it's doing this thing, and you can see it, how it's doing and everything. Any more? Yes, ma'am. If it's all right, I, if I can ask about the current exhibit that you have here and the um, catalog, the description of um, any of the pieces are, are so uh, complex and interesting. Um, do, do those concepts come to you along the way or before, like, the meaning of your pieces. Um, okay, so well, like in the catalog, if, if I remember correctly, the, the descriptions are pretty straightforward and basic. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, they're straightforward. I'm saying the, the concepts um, behind them, behind your pieces, so that we can know so, what the ideas are. Um, and you're asking me if the ideas. Into the world, politics, culture something broader than talking about the materials, which are wonderful, but... Oh, so are you asking me to kind of interpret the, some of the work, no, or...? My question is, um, I'm sorry. Those ideas... Okay, I, I got you, yeah. Um, a lot of times after the fact, um, you know, I'll have this idea I want to put together, and, and I'll look at it, and I don't know, maybe there's, there's just got to be a reason I'm doing this. Maybe part of it is, I mean, just to to learn something, but, um, but, but you did uh, mention Thumbsucker, and, and in that case, I, I was thinking, of, I, I don't like interpreting my work. I don't like setting a scenario up for people. I pretty much avoid that, but I mean, I, I was thinking about kind of this lonely figure and um, kind of the longing for the planet, sort of. Um, and it was also my own nostalgia for the whole NASA project. And, seeing them on the moon, because I, I remember that on TV. <laughs> yes? Can you talk about um, the skill in your work? Uh, uh, it seems as though you come up with your idea and you kind of find a way to make it most appropriately. You know, but uh, how, does, how does that work for you? How do you think about the skills that it takes to make these? Um, well, I, I try to... Um, I, I, I try to work... <coughs> honestly and, and, you know, directly to get it done without making it too fancy. 
Um, but, I mean, I was, I was initially thinking that I was trying to eliminate any kind of aesthetic, but it became an aesthetic in itself, you know, that, that becomes an aesthetic. So, it's, I mean, it's hard to just leave, do something and leave it and not look at it again. But I, I kind of try to do that, um, whatever gets the job done. Yes? Super glue, didn't you hear? <laughs> what? Oh, hold together? Oh, I'm sorry. You'll have to repeat it. Stable? No, so this is, um, uh, is uh, poly polyester resin. Um, I, um, so do you mean st uh, like the, the structure inside or? I mean, a lot of the, your pieces are very intricate and small, like big to small. And just interesting how everything seems so in place. Um, well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested in investigating um, different scales and just how, um, well, like in this, this piece, which is actually a, um, a mobile. I, I don't know if I mentioned it, but the, the the, f the little animals are kind of um, suspended in, in each other's mouths on a little pin, so it, they rotate in the wind. So the whole thing can constantly reconfigure. But um, so like that piece, and also the spin sink, which was the piece with the big gear going down to the little teeny tiny gear, um, are good examples of just I mean this kind of shoving scale down your throat a little bit. But, um, but I, I like it. Um, I don't think I answered your question very well, but <laughs> yes. Um, well, I, 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 I love your work, and I have seen that it's um, you've done a lot of recycling. You use a lot of not a lot of other things that we would never think of. You recycle them and you create something marvelous on them. But not only that, you create emotion. Um, for us, it feels so many emotions. Some of them have a lot of emotions that are. Uh, or sad or, or that brings dark emotions. Um, and as far as environmental and recycling, have you thought of um, hearing that and magnifying it as some words towards environmental you know, issues that we've even, have you ever thought of that? Um, I, I had a hard time understanding. Um, for one thing, I have a head cold and my hearing is messed up. But um, So, um, I. Don't really. Um, so, are you asking if, if um, I'm using recycled um, material? We have thought of driving your um, art that is very emotional and that is using recycled material towards uh, something environmentally, some of the environmental issues we have, so expanding to that area. It's not. Um, my, my work doesn't really go into political kind of issues, and I'm all for the environment, but I'm not using, I think the environment's great. I mean, it's getting, it's getting worse, unfortunately, but we should preserve it, of course. And, um, and I don't like being wasteful, but um, I think it's more just using materials that everybody's familiar with, kind of. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, take your pick. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, mine is sort of in that same area. Do all your Christmas trees become arts? <laughs> oh, good question. No. Yeah, and there's um, there's one drying out in my backyard, but I'm not sure. Um, no, not all of them, but sometimes I get an idea. And you had a question. Um, I can see that you're very creative in the materials you use to for your um, art pieces. And I was wondering, if, do you usually tend to like uh, let it just take you a certain way, or do you like sometimes feel like you mess up, like you restart, or use a different material? Oh well, um, there's a lot of messing up, but it's sort of a, a collaboration with messing up. So <laughs> you just allow it to mess up, and a lot of times that's even better than what your initial idea was. But um, 
it can also be kind of heartbreaking because you know you had high expectations and it didn't work out. So you have to be open for change, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, did you always feel that you were destined to be an artist? Was that was a straight line for you, or did you uh, have to struggle to get to this point? Well, I think early on, I think um, probably as early as high school, um, I had a, a really supportive high school art teacher, and that was kind of the age when I, towards the end of high school, I started thinking that it could be a serious option. And um, I, so um, they were having like at the graduation ceremony, they, they were doing like the, not the graduation, but like the night before they were having awards night or something like that. And there was no art award. It was all like, you know, the athletic trophies and stuff like that. But my art teacher wanted me to bring in these paintings that I've been working on and just have them kind of decorating the stage a little bit. And so I remember loading these paintings up into my, uh, my parents' car, driving them to my high school and thinking, wow, is this the start of something? You know, it was, it was, I mean, seriously, it was, it was so naive, but it was, um, it was kind of sweet. And to have that support was really nice. But I was, um, I was interested in, like I said, in music. And I was thinking of being a uh, musical instrument maker for a time. You are. Well, I still, I, I'm making some, yeah. Oh, but ones that you don't know about, actually, that you can play. OK, um, yes? Does liquid latex peel off your body easily? Was that just one shot, or was that multiple shots, super glued together? How did that work? Uh, no, it all stays. Um, it, it, it's real elastic, and it peels off easily. You can actually sort of sweat it off. I mean, it's, you have to keep it on until it dries. and. Um, Actually, I had to do a few coats. Um, I, I did it in two halves because I didn't, I'm not stupid. I didn't want to suffocate. <laughs> so I did like pajama bottoms and tops and, uh, and then joined them together. And um, so I, I did the piece when early on when the, I first did it in 1993, I think. And, um, and then it was going to be shown in a, a show um, maybe 10 years ago. Yeah, it was about 10 years ago. My daughter had just been born. And uh, um, we were going to inflate it, but it was kind of latex. Look at Eva Hess. I mean, they all kind of deteriorate. So I had to remake this piece. And, um, and now I'm remaking it as, as a young father. Well, not young, but as a, a father of a young child, of a baby. And she walks in while I'm covered with, uh, I look like a Schwarzkogler, this, this artist that, I don't know if you know him, but um, I, you know, I, I couldn't really move and I was covered with latex. I looked like I'd been dipped in oatmeal or something. It's daddy, honey, it's okay. So, and she just you know, walks out. But yes, to answer your question, it peels off easily and it sticks together. Um, what do you think? Thank you. Oh, thank you.